Cool. Where does it, where, did, oh, did it say that on the phone? Yeah. Yeah. Before I joined. Oh, gotcha. Um, sweet. So did you learn? Are you going to edit this for a tutorial? I might, <laughs> is that the, is that I, might the I might like chop it down and just like put, I, I have a YouTube channel and I'm trying to get more, you know, views. Oh, and, okay. And, uh -huh. Um, and so I'm just kind of collecting media and uh -huh. maybe one out of five times I actually do something with it. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, right. So, okay. So you were curious about, about like NLP in general or how did you, how did you hear about it? Well, I was um, describing to a friend um, what it's like to deal with my parents and certain family members and how it like, you know, triggers multi-day issues for me after every interaction with them. And I was like, okay, I think it's time to go back to therapy. And the friend was like, oh, you know, as well as I know that therapy doesn't work for this because you've tried it before. And like, I've heard of this thing called NLP where it sort of changes your memories or your reactions and stuff. And I was like, oh, that's interesting. And they're like, maybe you should check that out. So that's literally the groundwork for this. That's, so that's, that's it. Um, so so yeah. it wasn't, it wasn't uh, NLP Marin specifically. It was just, just NLP in general? Yeah, just in general. As something that I might want to undertake to, you know, like let go of um, recurrent like triggering. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Um, that's great. So the the course that I went through was primarily um, NLP Marin up in Marin County, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. the the traditional kind of NLP is fairly um, rudimentary in terms of the techniques of like the classic seventies NLP. Um, mm -hmm. NLP Marin practitioners use a lot more um, nuance and sophistication, I think, than like traditional NLP, and. Okay. Uh, when I went through that program, I actually learned a lot about, so like in the, in the format of the program, which was like an 18 month, if you go all the way, all the way through it, um, the, the, the format is that you, you kind of learn some content <clears throat> in the room and then you get into, you always work in groups of three. So there's a, there's like a, like a, what you call what they call the programmer, the person doing the, 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 the practitioner, um, mm -hmm. the, su the subject, and then a meta position that's watching the interaction. And you you learn every technique by going through all three of those things, so hmm. by, by the end of the program you've actually done a ton of work on yourself, which is kind of neat. Um, and I think that's one of the big differences with like traditional psychology and NLP is that if you go and get a psychology degree, you don't really do the work in the course of. I mean, maybe in some in some cases you do, but I, th I think that a lot of times like the the, the, the person learning is kind of off limits in some way or needs to be protected or um, is somehow better or better than the client or something like that. Um, mm -hmm. But going back to, to like, to like your case about maybe finding a practitioner that could help the two things that come to mind are um, uh, NLP and also um, EMDR that you've probably heard of. Okay. Um, if I have, I need a refresher on that. Sure. Um, <clears throat> EMDR I forget what it stands for, but it's basically a, it's basically a technique that uses um, eye movement generally like the, but it's a really easy, quick fix. And I did some EMDR and I was like, wow, this is, this is great. Um, and I was kind of down on it cause I thought there's, there's no way that something this simple can be that effective. Um, mm -hmm. But both EMDR and um, NLP deal with um sort of going back into previous experiences and uh, NLP specifically has this, this thing called um, the intervention is called changing personal history. And I realize I'm going to use some mm -hmm. terminology that's kind of clinical, I guess. Um, fine. And yeah, I mean, you're a, you're, you know, you deal with this stuff. I'm a, a pseudo psychologist anyway. Yeah. 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 <laughs> we're, we're both in the same, in the same boat there. Uh -huh. Um, but a lot of what it's about is going back and changing your experience of yourself when you were younger. Mm -hmm. 
and identifying, um, I guess you could say the triggers or the, you know, original causes of certain things. Um, Mm -hmm. and it's not about why it's not about like why you're so messed up. It's like how it's more like, how is it that your consciousness creates this experience for you? And that's really what NLP is about on the, on the most basic level is it's the study of our experience and how we Mm -hmm. construct our reality. Um, Mm -hmm. And a lot of the, the, a lot of the tools to get to, to get that information is the practitioner asking about um, what the experience was like, what what were the smells like, the sounds, the tastes, uh, the pictures. Um, Hmm. Another, another big part of NLP is being able to manipulate those pictures and sounds. Um, for example, if you, you know, if you imagine a, a, a recent traumatic experience and how it looked, if you take the picture of that and sort of put a border around it in your, in your mind and move it farther away and make it more, um, more black and white, and maybe a little fuzzy, the experience usually gets less intense. Hmm. Um, okay. So the idea is that if, this kind of goes back to the idea of it being like programming. Like if we can understand how our brains work, how our, our brains construct our experience, we can actually have some, some say over it. You know, we can say, I don't, I don't want to feel overwhelmed when I think about my mom. Okay. Well, mm-hmm. you know, we can choose, we can choose to have a different experience, but if you just say like, well, just stop it, don't be overwhelmed. Not so effective if you don't know the, the sort of levers to pull. Mm-hmm. Um, so that, that's one part of it. Another really okay, big part. That's interesting. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's kind of that's kind of what got me into it initially. And I think they do um I think they do some intros up at NLP Marin. You can just go and take one and um it's with one of the one of the really, really good practitioners, uh Carl Carl Bukait, I think. He's like the guy that founded NLP Marin. He's brilliant. Um Okay. And you'd probably be interested in that just intellectually and in addition to, you know, getting some work for getting some help for yourself. It's also Mm -hmm. a great place to meet a great practitioner. Like at the end, you can just ask, you know, ask the organizer like, Hey, I'm looking for a practitioner. Who do you recommend? Um, Okay. Yeah. That could be a good way to go. Mm -hmm. Um, But another big part of it is just realizing that like we are amazing creatures and, whatever stuff that you, that you developed that's giving you this experience that you don't want right to have about your parents or whatever, that was probably mm-hmm. really useful at some point. Um, and so a big part of it is, is getting in rapport. We call it getting in rapport with the client, getting in rapport with getting the client into rapport with their experience and with the younger version of yourself. And okay not just getting the words, but getting like getting the getting that, that little child to understand experientially that it's okay. And that, you know, what happened was for a good reason. And you can't just say, you can't just tell a person to do that. They have to get it as an experience. Mm. And so to do that, we use um, hypnotic language and, like a little bit of hypnosis and and techniques to bring the person back into the experience. Um, And then once you're there, we can work with, we can actually work with the experience that the little one was having and give them, give them insights. Um, Hmm. And and then through a, you know, through a delicate process, we can kind of grow them back up and bring them back into the, into your body, into, into present day, um, your present day body. And, um, through that, you can basically, that's what they call it, changing personal history. You can sort of change your experience of yourself. Um, cause what you think your experience was is just what you think, right? Like mm-hmm. your, what you call objective reality. It's just what you remember. It's probably mm-hmm. not even right. I mean, human beings are notorious for, um, what do we say? Deleting, distorting, and, uh, basically like the brain is really good at, misconstruing things um mm-hmm. and so there, a big part of it is just allowing a person to kind of like not take it so seriously and uh be okay with things how they are 
a lot of it's a kind of about, some of it's about acceptance, but it's more really about getting into rapport with what's so and kind of, kind of choosing for it to be the way it is. And, and this gets into sort of like some more of a mushy woo woo kind of, um, I don't know how to articulate it, but like, Oh, just accept it. It's okay. Everything's perfect. You know, like, no, it's not. I'm here mm-hmm. because I'm upset. Like, fuck that. <laughs> mm-hmm. And so you want, it's like, you want to be in rapport with the part of you that, that is really pissed off too. Um, so I don't know. That's kind of at a, like at a broad level, kind of what the, what it's about overall. Um, uh-huh. I, th- I mean, I think, going through the NLP Marin training was one of the best decisions I've made. And I, I, I found it intellectually really interesting and like personally transformative. And the, the stuff that I learned is like in my bones now, like I don't have to think about it. Yeah. Um, uh-huh. <clears throat> so you are a programmer. This course is like a programmer. Right. Certification yep. kind they of train, thing. They, yeah. train you to okay. be a, yeah. they train you to be a practitioner. You get uh-huh. a certificate at the end. There's a, there's like a testing process. Um, mm-hmm. and mo- most everyone passes you have to you really be not be, be paying attention to to not pass it mm-hmm. um, but it's also rigorous I mean when you get out of there you are trained and uh, there's um, there's study groups so you do a weekly there's a weekly get together where you're in, you're encouraged to, to get together and practice the material um, and it's about once a month for a Saturday Sunday or maybe it's like a Thursday Friday Saturday it's it's kind of a lot, but uh, by the end of those weekends, man, I'm just like spent, like, yeah, just like emotionally like worn out. Um, so before you took this course, did you have a more traditional experience where like a programmer worked with you and that's how you got interested? Or did you just go straight into the I'm going yeah, to be a programmer. That's a good question. No, I never, um, I heard about NLP when I was growing up. I think my parents had some books on a shelf or something. Um, uh-huh. And then, and I was always curious about it because it's kind of like this, like, like life hack way of, of getting transformation. Um, and I'm into hack, hacks and like ways of doing things <laughs> that are a little bit different. Um, uh-huh. And uh, I was actually on a date with a woman in Oakland and we were just chatting and she's like, yeah. And, and I took this NLP course at, at NLP Marin, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, there's an NLP Marin. Tell me more. Uh-huh. Um, yeah. Cause I always thought of it as this, like uh, this weird fringy thing that like, you know, only the elite people who like knew each other would learn about. Um, and it came out of the Santa Cruz in the seventies. Like it's, it's, it's kind of a fringy thing. Um, uh-huh. uh, so yeah, so I went on the date and I learned about NLP Marin and I went to an intro and I just ate it up. I was just, I just loved it. Um, and I went through the course. So I went all the way through the course and then I went through the, I was a, a training assistant for two years. So I assisted with the trainings. Um, uh-huh. And uh, I hadn't, I didn't, hadn't had a lot of experience with formal therapy or interventions before that. Um, Mm -hmm. I've done some courses, I've done some work with Landmark, um, but I I was always kind of, I always kind of thought like therapy, no, that's no good. That's not gonna, that's not what I need. Um, since then I did do some traditional therapy. I think I've maybe even to three or four therapists and one of them was good. Mm -hmm. Um, Traditional therapy just seems like, just like throwing mud at a wall and seeing what sticks. And if you're, if you're lucky enough to have someone who's good, then it's fantastic. But yeah. the, there's no structure to, as near as I can tell, there's no structure to the way that a traditional therapist heals you. Um, there's no framework. Uh, mm-hmm. you know, when, when you sit down in an NLP session, there is a framework. There, you, 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 ask, you ask the client, what would you like? What would you like to be experiencing? What would you like to be experiencing mm-hmm. more of or less of or have be different? And it's like, okay, now we've got something to work on. Um, And then there's very specific things you can do where you can say, okay, how, what's it like now? You know, tell me about your experience of your, of your mom and dad right now. And then how would you like it to be? And then we can actually use submodalities and other techniques to look at the difference, 
how the experience is actually concretely different between those two things. Um, hmm. And it just, it's just using the, using the language and the clarity really helps you using the, using the, the constructs and the techniques really helps you get clarity about it. Um, and I, I feel like when you have clarity, there's just less suffering. Um, mm -hmm. And realizing that. Yeah, I mean, like, the one. Oh, sorry. Go on. Just, well, just going to say, and just realizing that, like, you know, you're, you're having the experiences of an upset four year old or six year old. And mm -hmm. that's fine. Like, that four year old has a great reason to be upset. But the adult you, it's not useful anymore. And it's something you learned how to do. And you would just, you don't need to, to be doing that anymore. Um, mm -hmm. But you can't just tell a person, they have to get it as an experience. Yeah. No, I mean, describing it that way is, is in my, I mean, it makes it very spot on for me because it's like, I, you know, I've sat through the therapy and I've tried to work through some of this stuff in therapy and it just never, it right. never impacts me. Like if there's no change in how I, like my, you know, anger and whatever fe feel, because I feel angry about the stuff that happened in the past that has never been resolved. Yeah. Uh, um, so this does seem like, super interesting and I like for addressing what it is that I need addressed and I like I, I really like what you described like you kind of stayed up front what the goal is that's interesting because no therapist I've ever met has ever approached it that way right um but all I can picture is like revisiting like specific memories and whatever the plural of an incident incidences and like just crying like is there like a lot of crying involved <laughs> if, you're, if, you're, if, if, the th if the practitioner is doing a good job then yes usually uh-huh yeah okay yeah and that's fine and huh. there's, a, there's a good reason for that little one to cry like that's that's okay hmm. okay this is um, so yeah um yeah. and just, just just since we're since we're rapping about it um, there's one other thing I didn't really talk about, which is the idea of ecology. Um, one of the most important things for, for an NLP practitioner to do is, is think in terms of the ecology of the change. And so it's like, what's the, what's the good thing about having that experience? What do you, what, mm -hmm. what did the little one get from that? You know, from, mm -hmm. and, and what's the, what's the good thing about you having it today or what's the good thing about you not letting it go, right? If you let it go, what would you lose that you value, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes the thing you want or the experience you're having, like you're like, Oh, usually there's like a, like an insight, like a moment of insight, like, Oh, that's why, you know, that basically like, that's why I'm so fucked up. Um, mm -hmm. And it just makes sense. And then there's just a lot more freedom. You know, you don't, it's kind of like, you don't take it so personally. Hmm. Um, and along the way, along the way, it can, you know, it can get bumpy too. It can, you can get more, more in tune with those negative feelings. Um, but throughout, you know, through a few sessions, it's, and it's usually very fast too. It's like, if you see someone more than four times, you're, you're probably working on something completely different. Oh, really? It's yeah, it's fast. Huh. Um, oh, that's super interesting. Okay. Yeah, in the in the seventies when Richard Bandler was kind of came up with this, um, he would do these these interventions and change people and he was so just pissed off at the at like the talk therapy the world of talk therapy and psychology. He was like, You you guys just keep working with people and you never fix them. Like Yeah. You know, you if you if you, if you have an outcome in mind, you can fix it. Um and so the the NLP world and the psychology world, like NLP guys think psychology is, is BS and psychology guys think NLP is BS. And it's, it's a really funny little back and forth. Huh. Um, I mean, I didn't start a peer support company because I, you know, thought therapy was useless. Like I believe they coexist, but part of the reason why I sat down and looked at the mental health market and tried to figure out what was missing was because of what you just said, like, or what, what these guys just said. I feel like therapist business model is to keep you in therapy. <laughs> right. It's like, it does kind of like make me 
frustrated with the system. Um, yeah, interesting. Okay, huh. Wow. I'm trying to think what else I can share. Um, I think what I loved about it is just like as a practitioner, you get concrete techniques, like there's a process you go through and it also requires mm -hmm. a lot of cr creativity and nuance and sensitivity. Um, but it's a, um, it's nice that there is, a, there, like there is a manual, but doing the stuff in the manual requires attention to detail and compassion and empathy and care and love and mm -hmm. all those things. Um, have you heard this idea that like 80% of the efficacy of a, of a, of a practitioner um, is kind of how they're being in the session and not what they're doing? Mm, no, I haven't. There was some study where that, that I, I think it was a study. I mean, of course I'm setting some study, but I think there was, <laughs> there was some study that said that like the efficacy of a, of a, of a mental health professional is, like 80% sort of like who they are and like how they're being with the client and like 20% 20, 20 actually what they're doing. So whether it's talk therapy or NLP or EMDR or CBT, you know, or like, mm -hmm. you know, trust falls or whatever, it's more just like, you know, I think a lot of it is just like really being heard and like, um, I don't know, there's a big piece of that. And there's also a lot of, this, this, this just, just came to mind, there's also a lot of um, using the parent-child relationship in the intervention, like reparenting, re I guess there's a technique called reparenting, which I don't know if, I don't think it's NLP exactly, but um, this idea that, you know, our parents, our parents are responsible for most of our, most of our trauma and you can reparent yourself or, or reparent another and, and use the same pathways that the little one learned um, to sort of, you know, make the, the adult more proficient or more, um, there's, a, there's a word that they use, not proficient. Um, resourced, I guess, more resourced. It took a lot about resources. Hmm. Um, okay. And then on the other side of it, a lot of people also use NLP for like sales training and like being a better salesperson and having more personal power and, um, you know, Tony Robbins, get what you need, you know, get what mm. you want out of life. Um, hmm. There's a lot of NLP That's around weird. that. Yeah. Is that why it gets a bad rap? Because it morphs into that kind of stuff? Or? That's, a, that's a big part of it. Yep. Okay. Uh, because you can do things, you know, if you're good with the language techniques, you can do things to change somebody's internal experience, right? So if you're, if you're thinking about buying a vacuum cleaner, I can have you imagine all the great things that you'll get when you have the vacuum cleaner, um, you know, and, and put you into a trance state a little bit and, you know, connect that with your <laughs> highest values and like, oh, yeah, I, that's a great idea. I should get that vacuum cleaner. Um, hmm. So in sales, people use NLP in sales techniques, in negotiations, um, and in like the pickup artist world too. NLP is really big because you can oh, okay. do things to change someone's experience in a, in a dating context. Um, some people say that that's all, that's manipulation. Some people call that communication. Mm -hmm. Um but I think, I mean, I think anything that helps you be a better communicator is good. It's just, it's like a tool, you know, it's like a, a scalpel uh, can save a life or it can kill someone. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's good to have access to powerful tools. Hmm. Am I hogging too much of your time? I no. do have another question that I want to try. Okay. No, Thank ahead. you. <laughs> um, so I didn't, say anything at the time, but in your, you know, uh, recounting of things that you've, you've tried and gone through, you mentioned Landmark. Yeah. And I do know about them because when um, my co-founder and I started Supportive, we actually went to a Landmark um, weekend to try to like understand, it was part of our like, kind of like, let's study support groups and see what people are getting out of them. Okay. Um, and I did not love it. 
I actually got kicked out at the end of it. Good for because you. Because I didn't do like the last exercise <laughs> or the second to last or third to last or whatever it was. And I just, I felt like it was very contrived and you know, like over the top. So I'm curious, like how you, what, what you're like, what you're, I mean, I just told you my opinion first, so I'm hopeful I'm not biasing you, but like how you would compare going through NLP versus going through like a landmark forum weekend. Oh, lots of people hate it. So, so you, you did the forum, you did the whole three day weekend and then. Uh, I did a three day weekend, but I, I got, I, when I showed up the third day, they said I couldn't participate anymore because I was like not taking it seriously. Did the, did the leader, did the forum leader like make an example of you in front of the room? No, or? no. I just got like denied entry to the room. That sucks. Huh. But, you know, I, there was like the, the experience where on the second day, everyone like closes their eyes and like shouts stuff out. I like couldn't take it seriously. I just kind of like did not shut my eyes and was like looking at it like what the hell is going on. And they didn't like that. I didn't like fully immerse myself in it. Huh. This was the this was the landmark, the landmark forum, the Friday, Saturday, Sunday and half of Sunday. Tuesday. Thing. Yes, exactly. So I got denied entry on Sunday and then I didn't go. I did a Tuesday night before like the as the my my the intro night. So I saw sure. a Tuesday be before my own session, but I didn't I wasn't allowed to do Sunday or yeah. um Tuesday. Did you get your money back? No. Um hmm. yeah. That's interesting. I would, I would, I would try to get. I'd be like, you guys didn't give me like you didn't fulfill your end of the contract. <laughs> yeah, it was, I mean, this is over a year, a year and a half ago now, so I'm not gonna. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, a, a lot of people talk a lot of shit about Landmark, and I think it's gotten a lot better and more palatable. I don't remember the the thing that you're talking about with closing your eyes and and yelling stuff. It sounds totally mm -hmm. like something they would do. Um, <laughs> so maybe it's changed. Maybe the the course has changed. Mm -hmm. I know that it had its origins um, in uh, Warner Earhart kind of came up with uh, the Earhart seminar training and kind of in the, um, in the seventies, um, what was it called? Like human potential movement and um, encounter groups and that whole thing. And supposedly Warner stole a lot of, um, a lot of the stuff in the forum he took from Scientology, oh, mm -hmm. which is an interesting connection. Um, and there was a bunch of scandals with Werner and like, you know, like sex scandals and IRS problems. And <clears throat> mm -hmm. um, there's a whole bunch of drama with it. Um, but, but one thing I noticed this, so I've, I've, I've gone through the forum twice. Um, the first time I got a, a lot of freedom and I think it really freed me up to become who I am now. And, um, and to kind of, kind of like, I think of the forum, like, it's sort of like the fast food of personal growth. It's like low price, easy consumption, you know, six ninety nine burger and fries and, and you're full and, you know, and it tastes good and it's easy. Um, and I think of the forum, like kind of like that experience, like anyone can do it. You go in, you get transformation, you know? Um, mm -hmm. I know that they're also, they're making it more and more like, they're working on their reputation as this like really sort of like scummy salesy organization. Um, mm -hmm. So the content has been changing. Like they didn't, did they use video screens when you went through it? No. Uh -uh. These chalkboards or uh, uh, whiteboards. Yeah. Whiteboards, yeah. So now they use video screens. Um, hmm. So they're, they're changing the way it's delivered and stuff. Um, I'm so curious what the intervention was that you, that you, that you couldn't take seriously. Cause that's great. Like that's a great teaching moment. It's like, you know, Hey, why can't you take this seriously? Let's talk about it. And if the, you know, if the form leaders worth their salt, they should, they should be able to like get you something out of that and get everyone else in the room, something by working with you. Hmm. Um, but what I noticed about the, what I, when I noticed this, so the first time I got a lot of freedom, like freedom and, and out of it, the second time I noticed a ton of NLP in the content, the way they deliver it. Um, 
it's like I was looking at, it's like my analogy was like, it's like seeing a skyscraper and seeing the girders underneath the skyscraper that are holding it up. Um, hmm. okay. Cause I knew, I knew all the techniques I knew about, you know, chunking up and chunking down and um, you know, how, how to, I don't want to use the manipulate, how to work with someone's um, uh, perceptions, right? Um, like even, even yeah. that, that, that thing that they say right in the beginning, you know, anything you want for yourself and your life can be fulfilled through your participation. And it's like, okay, I want that. I want things for myself in my life. That sounds great. Let's do that. Um, and it's, that's, you know, that's, that's chunking up. It puts you in a trance state. Um, hmm. So the thing that, uh, the reason it sounded similar to me was more, was the, um, um, like changing your experience of yourself or like deleting the distorting to me. That they, I think they just call that your personal story. And it's always like, well, that's right. like your perception of something. That's your story. That's only your side of it. Like, how are you going to change your story? And so like I've used that in my life. Like I, I actually think about that phrasing a lot and like think about how I'm perceiving stuff, but um, that's really all I got out of it. Like I didn't, I wasn't able to, you know, fix any historical stuff. Right. Um, yeah. One of the big, so like the, one of the big things on Sunday is that they, they talk about how we are basically meaning making machines that, the whole, the whole point of your brain is just to make sense of your world at any cost, even if it means, you know, you thinking you're a bad person or, you, or you're not good enough or you'll always be this way or whatever. And that, that's all just meaning that you made up. It's not true. It's story. Um, mm -hmm. And once you realize that, the, the transformation is like, oh, my gosh. Every, basically, they say everything about you is a lie. It's all a bunch of trauma that you made up when you were a kid. And, you know you've been living in, you've been living in this, this experience that is the experience of a, of a three-year-old for the past 30 years. Mm -hmm. Now that you know that, what would you like to experience? How would you like it to be? And fundamentally that's, that, that's a big part of the NLP thing. Um, but it's not presented the same way. It's not this like big catastrophic, you know, dramatic intervention. I mean, NLP Marin's mm -hmm. work is, is much more nuanced and, and delicate and loving and quiet. And, um, mm -hmm. and in the learning of it, you don't, you're, you don't have to do like it's, they don't, it's not pushy. They're terrible, terrible salespeople at NLP Marin. Um, whereas Landmark, they're very good salespeople. Mm -hmm. um, hmm. So I think that, and I think the, the more different modalities I've seen over time, the more I see similarities or across different, different things, different modalities. Um, and that, that leads me to think that there, there are some, some truths out there in terms of techniques that are, you know, more that, that work in more contexts or that are more generally like effective. Um, you know, some people are really into like the somatic thing and like, oh, where, where are you feeling that feeling in your body? I'm like, man, mm -hmm. I can't stand that shit. Like, <laughs> I, I, you know, I'm not, uh -huh. I'm not feeling, I'm not feeling remorse in my spleen right now. You know, like, get off of it. <laughs> okay. Um, but then there's, yeah, there's some stuff like, you know, your experience as a kid and like traumas, like, you know, your parents, like even Freud knew that, right? You get your shit from your mm -hmm. parents. And it's, yeah. I didn't want it to be true because it's like, oh, am I really that, you know, simple and obvious? And mm -hmm. you know Perceptible. what? Yeah, yeah, we are. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> okay. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, uh, okay, so that was a good, that's a good kind of, you know, frame of reference between, I just, I didn't like the landmark, like, stuff everyone in a room and do this all and, like, you know, right. your own path, but in front of everyone else. And so I think maybe some of the techniques that have purpose and impact, like to be able to do them on, in one-on-one -on -one would be much more appealing to me right. personally. Yeah. And yeah. There, I think there are, excuse me, <clears throat> I think there are, there, I mean, there are things about, it's called, it's called large group awareness training. There are things about that 
that are useful, and there are also things that are not useful about it. Um, and that was a big thing in, in like the 70s, like, you know, these, these large group awareness trainings were kind of like the in thing. Um, but yeah, you don't have to do, you don't have to do that. And, um, and a lot of the, a lot of the landmark stuff is, is a lot more intellectual and, and like thinking and heady. Um, and good, good NLP is just, you're just talking to someone and they're taking you through an experience and, um, you don't have to remember anything. You don't have to remember to be different or like, you know, you don't have to agree. Um, it's much more just as a, you know, as, as someone who's getting the work done, you just, you just, you're just feeling what you're feeling and someone's there with you talking to you about it. Mm -hmm. Um, but what they're doing is very intentional and very directed. Um, and it's not by accident that you get better from it. Mm -hmm. And is there always someone else in the room, like the assistant or the observer? No, person? no, that's just, that's just for the purposes of learning the, the meta, the meta position. Uh -huh. um, it's just, okay. it's a, but it's a common thing. Um, it's a common thing in when in all of the NLP schools, there's usually somebody who's observing, who's watching both the practitioner and the, and the subject. Um, and I think that came from when, when NLP was invented in the seventies, Richard Bandler was actually a computer guy at UC, at uh, Santa Cruz. And mm -hmm. this is when computers were the size of rooms, right? Com like programming was this very clunky thing back then. Um, but to make some money, he was transcribing audio and video of, um, of these sessions. So he was sit like sitting in a little room transcribing these video sessions of, of therapists um, looking at, you know, looking at the therapist and looking at the subject. And he started wondering why are some of these therapists so effective and some of them are just not, what's the difference? Cause they're doing the same thing. Um, mm -hmm. And so he started breaking that down and he started sort of applying a, um, a scientific, not really scientific, but like a scientific rigor. Um, <clears throat> and that's kind of where NLP came from is, is watching what worked and what didn't. Hmm. Um, and then he developed mm -hmm. this, this system like, okay, well, people are paying attention to, oh, and then he would interview people and he would say, okay, so what are you doing when you do that? And most, most great practitioners are like, well, I don't know. I just I'm just having a conversation, <clears throat> but he was able to recognize the patterns. Um, and through doing that, he was like, oh, okay. So you're watching their skin tone and their people dilation and their, um, you know, various physiological things. And that's something they train mm -hmm. us to do is pay attention to physiology a lot. Um, but if you're somebody in who's in the session, you don't, you don't know any of that. You don't know what they're doing. You're just having a conversation. Yeah. Okay. Got it. Okay. Um, Man, I don't know. I just think this is super interesting. It, and this, again, this is like nothing like what I was able to just skim and read online. So this is yeah. really, really <laughs> Yeah, it's it, a lot of that's really terrible. And something uh -huh. else I've heard is that a lot of the, um, when they evaluate um, like, like psychology, psychological protocols, um, uh -huh. you have to like stick to a, a script that describes the intervention. And if you, if you go off that script in the, um, if you go off that script, it, it invalidates the experiment. It's like, well, you didn't, you're not doing the intervention the way it's described. Doing good work requires, you know, all sorts of different maneuvers and, 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 uh, you know, capabilities and, and the ability to, um, you know, to be creative in the session and all this stuff. And so whenever they try to compare NLP to like some other stuff, um, they don't really get great results. And a lot of NLP is total pseudoscience. There's some stuff about eye movements that's like, eh, I don't know, maybe. Um, so I don't, I don't think it's like religion. I don't think it's the truth. Um, mm -hmm. But man, I think it's useful. And okay. I, I mean, I really encourage you to go to do one of the intros and see if it resonates. Um, yeah. And, uh -huh. um, and if you do get into it, the, the, one of the things I love about it is that 
uh, they, NLP starts with these things called the, the presuppositions and they're not like things that are necessarily true, but they're useful to hold as true. Um, and those, those presuppositions, man, I've integrated those into my life. You know, like I, I believe that everyone's doing the best they can with what they have. Um, and some people just are, don't have the resources that they need. And so it's not like someone's deficient. Mm -hmm. We just have to get them the resources. Um, but if I'm, if I'm working with you and I'm sitting there believing like, oh, this person's, this person's dumb. They're never going to get it. They're never going to be any good. You know, I'm just reinforcing what you're experiencing. It's like, that's not helping. Mm -hmm. um, so. Yeah. So are you an active programmer now? Like, do you work with people? Is that part of what you do? No, I wanted to for a while. Um, I think that would drive me nuts at some point. Um, <laughs> Uh -huh. And I'm also, I would, I'm definitely rusty compared to how I was a few years ago. I mean, it's been years since a couple, uh -huh. years, a couple of years since I've been through it, but most of my interest is now is in working with, um, with, with teams and doing teaching and um, sort of like uh, self-management and organizations um, in helping people kind of work better together and, and kind of like reducing the suffering in the workplace. Um, okay. That really resonates with me. I mean, I, I think that like good, good work is play and like people should, there shouldn't really be a good, like if you have a great job, you sh there shouldn't really be a distinction. Like you enjoy creating and you enjoy making people's lives better and that's what you're up to. And I want to help people do that more effectively. Um, and I think there's just a ton of suffering in the workplace, you know? Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And the, there's, they're, they're, they're in, people are impoverished. I mean, all this stuff about mindfulness, like mindfulness is really the big thing in business right now. Like, come on, you know, <laughs> like there's, so, there's yeah, so much more I, depth there. I'm so over, I mean, I was, I, I never like embraced it from day one, but I'm so over how obsessed people are with it. Cause I'm like, in, in my mind, it's just about blocking out your feelings and ignoring your feelings for certain durations of time. And like, doesn't resolve anything. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, that's my, yeah. And like, I, you know, there's a, there, this is kind of an NLP thing. It goes back to ecology. It's like, there's a really good reason that we hold that stuff inside sometimes. Like uh -huh. when I'm in a negotiation with my boss, I don't want to be real connected to my feelings of vulnerability, you know, like well, yeah. <laughs> whatever, whatever it may be. There's, there's, uh -huh. useful, there are useful things about, our behavior and yeah you want to be able to get connected to your feelings um but not if it's in a, not if it's a hostile situation and most work environments are i think mm -hmm. yeah um, you know so i think there's a ton of potential to just to just make make the world a better place and give people a better experience of life and, and reduce suffering through mm -hmm. making people's jobs better and their work experience better um, so that takes us to the higher club stuff. I mean, I, I took a look at it um, after you mentioned it. And um, I mean, right now it just seems to be about people who are job searching. I mean, is part of what you're going to be doing with them kind of expanding the scope of their offerings. Yeah. So there's, there's, there's two pieces to it. Um, so higher club is a project that my friend Ketten started like many years ago and it just started as a Facebook group. And he's uh -huh. been de developing it out as a product and he wants to bring coaching to like, if there's, if 1% of professionals have a coach right now, he wants to bring coaching to the, you know, the other 99%, um, mm -hmm. which makes a lot of sense to me. Um, but he's a friend of mine and we've worked on a few projects uh, as programmers in the past and different startups. And um, I was helping him out with some programming and then uh, building out his, his product. Uh, he just applied for YC and he didn't get in. So I'm not going to be doing programming for him because it's too expensive um, for mm -hmm. him. Um, but what I'm doing, um, I just spent the past four years working for a company called Holacracy One. And they do, um, they do organizational self-management. They go into companies and they, they, they transform how power and authority works by putting in a, a, a system of rules, a, a governance system that allows people to change how the organization works and do their work and get their needs met 
organizationally without having to just rely on a boss who becomes a parent, you know, like a parental figure. Um, mm-hmm. And that was also really transformative for me. I, I kind of think of holacracy as NLP for organizations. Um, hmm. You know, NLP gets you, gets you freedom personally by giving you the, the, the concepts and constructs to be able to think about your environment and your world more effectively. And holacracy gives you the concepts and constructs to think about your work environment more effectively. Um, and so now I'm interested in doing self-management consulting um, using some of the techniques that I learned uh, by working at Holacracy One. Um, I'm not part of their licensing program, so I can't like I can't get paid to do Holacracy implementations unless I join the licensing program. Um, but I am a certified coach. Um, I passed all the tests for for what it takes to do Holacracy coaching, and so I'm just doing mm-hmm. self management consulting uh, generally and applying some of those techniques that I learned. Um, Have you come across a company out of New York called Bravely? Bravely, no. So I don't know a ton about it, um, but the founder is someone that I knew in the digital health world and I'm still, you know, friendly with. Um, his name is Toby Harvey, but it's it's really kind of growing very quickly and it's about like counseling inside of the workplace um, for kind of, you know, like conflict issues and yeah, um, like, so I, so I mean, I would just because this is the field that you're, in, you know, focused on, I would suggest checking it out. There's, there's like two or three companies named bravely right now, but it'll be the workplace one. Yeah. I, I, I found <laughs> it. And um, if it's interesting to you, I'm, I can, you know, reach out to the founder and connect you if you want to chat with him. Yeah. Cool. Um, I, def- I definitely, I'm not, I'm not making any money right now. I'm basically, um, uh-huh. I'm, I'm basically, I'm working on uh, kind of like products to support self-management in terms of programming and then chatting with a couple a couple of companies about helping them out. Um, but I definitely uh-huh. need to get hooked up with, um, with, with, people who can kind of help me help others. Mm-hmm. I think okay. that, yeah. Um, one of my, one of my big things was um, like you know, growing up, I was an only child. And so one of my issues was this idea that like I can do everything myself and I don't need anyone and mm-hmm. leaning on my intelligence. And that worked really well for me. And I really didn't need anyone for a long time, but now it's, um, now it's now it's empty and now i'm really i'm really like from an nlp perspective like now i'm suffering because i'm using the same techniques that i used when i was 10 to try to make mm-hmm. my life work when i'm 40 um and uh so that's like one of the transformations for me is like being like oh no i really do need people and i'm part of an ecosystem and um that's one of my growth edges right now yeah cool i mean good good on you for recognizing that um yeah well let me i mean uh look I, i'm i i would have to dig up his email but i'm sure i can find yeah. it or get it from talk to him on linkedin or something and but i'm like let just you know tell me if you want me to storm yeah, ahead and making an intro or if you want to send me like a little bullets on what you would want me to say to him that kind of stuff yeah i'll, I'll let you know i don't think i have a speci- i don't have a specific like ask or anything um, or specific uh-huh. need. Um, but I think that may change over time. I mean, it could just be that, it could just be that having a conversation with, with, with him would be a great way to open something up, but it looks like mm-hmm. he's doing all right. It looks like he's nice and busy. This is pretty cool. Yeah. Like they, they, I, as far as I can tell, they're growing like, you know, wildfire. Um, and it's interesting because he completely, I mean, he went into a different field. I mean, I guess what he was doing, he was one of the co-founders of a company called Pager, which was like the first or one of the first um, like on-demand doctor at your house, like house call services, okay. which now is everywhere again. But he, like he was on that original team. And then I think he had a falling out with those co-founders um, and just left and opened this. So, um, 
yeah, but I, I like I, you know, I still come, I still, I feel like I see him at conferences, um, and all I hear is that they're booming. Just yeah. blowing up, yeah, yeah. I yeah. haven't found, I haven't, I definitely haven't found like a niche yet. Um, mm-hmm. But I'm also, I'm enjoying the creativity of like figuring out how to help organizations um, and kind of coming up with my own offering and kind of being an independent and maybe it's foolish. Mm -hmm. Maybe maybe I should just go, you know, partner, partner with someone or work for someone. Um, But I mean, I get it. There's, you know, and, and I, in my own life, I've, what's the word like oscillated between wanting to do independent work and wanting to be part of a team. And like, you know, there's just different phases of life and feelings you go through. Um, but one of my professors at one point, cause I thought about being a writer, like many years ago coming out of grad school, I think I just was like too inundated with people in my face all the time. And I was like, I don't want to work in business. I want to be a writer. And my professor was like, you know, you're choosing something extraordinarily lonely and think a lot about like the impact of loneliness. And I was like, Oh, okay. (laughs) So part of what I look I you know, I barely, barely know you, but with you describe living in the country and you know, you've left vibrant, annoying Oakland or whatever. And like, you know, you, you're in a reclusive stage right now. Like that's great. And maybe that's what you really need and it's perfect, but also, um, you know, you may make yourself lonely. Yeah. Oh, that's a huge thing. Yeah. And I've been, I've been suffering with that for a long time. And I mean, I just worked at, I work at, I worked at home for the past four years. Uh-huh. Um, and that was extremely isolating but there was also this thing about like, no, it's future of work and I'm super lucky and I should be proud that I'm, I'm so independent and, but no, mm-hmm. I'm, just, I'm just suffering for no good reason. <laughs> There's probably some truth to that. No, it's both. It's, it's never like wholeheartedly one or the other. It's both. But, um, you know, like as you just recognize, you want to like temper one of your impulses that got you where you are, like, you know, it's figuring out how to, temper impulses that aren't going to lead you where you want to be. I think yeah. this is, this is my pseudo psychology. I can't, I do this all the time now. It's so annoying. I, know, that's great. That's <laughs> I have no psychological training, but I read transcripts all day and I just feel like I'm picking it up. <laughs> oh, you tra- tra- yeah. those are transcripts from, from clients at supportive or something. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's all anonymous. I have no idea who they are. Um, but yeah, I read them and I see what the conversations are about. And I, you know, like I've, I sat there with the professor who created our training curriculum and kind of in my layman's terminology told him what I wanted the curriculum to be. And he made it scientific, um, stuff like that. So I feel like I have this super unprofessional, but bird's eye view of like a lot of different stuff. And then I just cannot help but applying it in a haphazard manner. Yeah, I love it. Yeah, you should, you should go check out Alan P. Marin. You'll be right at home there. Uh-huh. Okay. <laughs> no, I really, so I mean, you've, you've given me, I, I, what I wanted was like a visual for what the experience was like as the person being, program and you've given bits and pieces of that to me and it makes me feel like I can see myself going through it and I can see myself benefiting benefiting from it so um so I I really appreciate that very much yeah it was fun to talk to you thanks I'm surprised we never got to before yeah I don't know like I I honestly can't even remember if we talk or if we only ever just exchange messages like my memory is very fuzzy um maybe we talked on the phone once yeah that's about that's just, roughly the memory that i have too yeah like we kind of almost yeah. connected but not quite yeah i always thought it was just the weirdest coincidence ever that you were doing work in chester springs pennsylvania like i couldn't believe it <laughs> <laughs> <That's amazing. laughs> so strange yeah um 
Yeah, and I long since, like, I deleted Tinder. I actually deleted Instagram. I was so sick. I was like, I can't. I don't want this. I don't want this. Like, And I actually reinstalled it to reach out to you. I'll tell you oh, that wow. because I, that's the only way I knew how, that I, I was like, I know you're on there. And I know I can find these Chester Springs posts. So that's why I reached out to you on Instagram. So I didn't know any other way to get in touch with you. That's incredible. Um, I, thought, I thought you were like all yeah. over your supportive social media and like in, Instagram was your main what method of contact. Wow. No, I hate Instagram. I mean, you know, we have like a social media intern that was doing stuff and we even gave it up because it just isn't the right channel for communicating what we do. Um, so even as a company, we kind of abandoned Instagram, but I only ever created an account to try to understand Instagram for business purposes. And I, I just was like, I don't like this. Like, it's just too, it's, it's another thing that's like pinging me and distracting me from real life. And I don't like it. So I I think what happened is I never deleted my account. I just deleted the app off my phone, which is what made me able to find you. Yeah. I just reinstalled it and found you. Amazing. Yeah. Well, let me know. Let me know how it goes. I mean, I, you, I might know the practitioner that you end up working with too. Um, yeah. I could even. I can. Um, I will. Mm-hmm. I can so even, go ahead. I can email you a couple recommendations. I think too. Um, that would be awesome. I mean, I I'm starting from scratch, so I don't. You know, I won't know who's good and who's bad unless I just ask around. Um, I shouldn't say good and bad, but you know, more talented and right. no, less talented. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. I'm happy to stand that's up. What, what should we just switch to email? Like I, I'm going to delete Instagram again now, so I won't bug you that way. Yeah, that sounds good. <laughs> okay. We can start with email yeah. and take it from there. Okay. That's cool. Okay. Awesome. awesome. Well, good to talk to you. Yeah, you too. Thank you so much. Um, I hope you get a lovely countryside day in Wisconsin. Sounds good. I'll uh, I'll let you know. Uh, maybe I'll take a picture out the window or something so you can see it. Oh, that sounds fun. Yeah. Okay, cool. Thank you. Okay, I'll talk to you later. Yeah, have a good day. Bye. Bye-bye.